It is officially Christmas season. So mark your calendars and invite your friends to our Christmas events, including the Living Nativity on December 21st through the 23rd from 6 to 8 p.m., a Silent Lord's Supper on December 21st from 6 to 8 p.m., our Christmas Eve service at 5 p.m., our Christmas Day service at 11 a.m., and our combined service on New Year's Day at 11 a.m. This week is our last week of Wednesday night meals and activities for the remainder of the year. These activities will start back on January 11th. Forgive me, I'm going to be preaching sitting. Uh, the stomach flu went through the staff, and I've been its latest victim. Um, I'm not contagious, but I haven't eaten in a couple of days, so I'm a little worn out. Um, but I'm here. <laughs> so I want you to take your Bibles or your apps, whatever you read on. And today we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 as we get to celebrate Christmas together. Now, if you're not sure how to find Luke, I've got a graphic up on the screen behind me, and it's got instructions on how to find the book. So if you want to grab one of the Bibles out of the pew, if you brought your own, uh, feel free to follow the directions up on the screen behind me. If you're in an app, we're in the Bible app, and you can follow along there if you would like to. Uh, so you can follow the directions that are on the screen uh, to find Luke chapter 1. Now, have you ever had such wonderful news that you just wanted to scream it from the mountaintops? I've had several moments like that, several incidents. I mean, I found out about the, the, my wife being pregnant with Declan right before I was about to go on stage and preach at my last church. Can you imagine? I'm about to go on stage, and I made the mistake of asking my wife what the results of her pregnancy test was right before I'm going on stage. Yeah, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. But you may find this hard to believe, but I used to get in so much trouble as a kid for talking too much. Can you imagine that? Me? I mean, wild. But in eighth grade, I got in trouble during winter season. I was talking too much on the bus. And I got in trouble so much that the bus driver went and talked to the superintendent or the principal or somebody, and I got kicked off the bus for three days. Well, my mom multiplied that because I deserved it and kicked me off for a week and made me walk to school. Now, my home to my school was about a 20-minute walk. And so I walked to school. Well, guess what? Within that week that I was grounded from the bus, I got in trouble again for talking too much. So guess what I got grounded from some more? The bus. And guess what happened the week after that? I got kicked off the bus because I was talking too much three weeks straight. Now, the upside was I had a lot of time to walk and think. And I had this huge assignment that had been assigned to the whole class. We had to write a Christmas poem. And it was part of like a, a, a statewide in the state of Texas, Southwest Airlines sponsored this What Does Christmas Mean to Me uh, contest. And so as part of this statewide contest, all of us in eighth grade had to write a poem about what Christmas meant to us. And so I had 40 minutes every day for three weeks to write this amazing poem. And guess what? February, I found out, I got a call that I had won that contest. No kidding. Now, this is not a lesson, teenagers, to get in trouble and get kicked off the bus or whatever. But when I got that phone call, I was at home, I was by myself, and the phone rings and I pick it up, and it's this representative from Southwest Airlines, and they say, hey, can we talk to Kim Turner? I was like, well, that's my mom. Oh, are you Chad? Yes. Well, you've won this, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah! And I couldn't talk to anybody about it. I was, what do I do? I'm stuck at home. And this was before cell phones. None of my friends had phones. And I hung up the phone, and I just screamed. I was so excited. I couldn't believe that I'd won. Southwest Airlines gave me and another person of my choosing two free tickets anywhere they flew. And I was so excited about it. And I wanted to scream it, and I wanted to tell everybody. But who was I going to tell? 
I was at home <laughs> by myself. But it was such great news, and I was so excited. When my mom came home from work, the first words out of my mouth were, guess what I won? <laughs> and so later that year, my mom and I went to San Diego free on Southwest, uh, on Southwest ticket. So this is a season of great news. And today, I want to talk about a couple of times in this time of great news where announcements are given. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke 1. Now in Luke 1, Luke was written by a guy named Luke. He was a physician. He, he was Peter and Paul's physician. And he writes this letter and the following letter of the book of Acts uh, to Greek speakers. Uh, if you ever sit and read the book of Luke, you'll find that he explains everything Jewish that he mentions. When he mentions some kind of Jewish practice, he, he explains it because he realizes that he's speaking, he's writing to Greek people, not Jewish people. And so he writes this great letter about the life of Jesus. He did his research, he interviewed Peter and the other apostles, and he, he did the research and put together one of the greatest books of all time, the book of Luke. Now, in verses 5 through 25, we read about this guy named Zechariah. Now, Zechariah was a, a priest. He was a Levite. And he got the opportunity to go. He, he, his lot was picked, and he got the opportunity to go in and serve inside the temple. This very rarely ever happened. And so he's very excited, and he goes in, and guess what happens? God speaks to him. And he tells them that he and his wife Elizabeth are going to have a son. Now, they've been barren. They've not had any success in having kids. And so this has been a prayer of theirs for a very long time. Their entire married life, they've been praying for a child. And nothing's happened. And he questions the angel in the temple. Well, are you sure this is what's going to happen? And the, the, the angel basically says, well, since you doubt so much and you need so much proof... You're going to be mute. You're not going to be able to speak. <laughs> Good job. And so he goes out, and sure enough, later on, Elizabeth, his wife, becomes pregnant. Their son will be John the Baptist, the one that will prepare the way for Jesus uh, before Jesus' ministry begins. Then, look with me in verse 26. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city, to the city of Galilee, a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, this is an odd occurrence. Look at Mary's response in verse 29 very next verse. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern or understand what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Well, this is the best part. Look at verse 32. He will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom there will have no end. Isn't that amazing? Now, little backstory here is the Jewish people, we know both from historical records and from a few things that the Bible records, the Jewish people were actually actively looking out for the Messiah. They had discerned the prophecies in the book of Daniel. And if you read the book of Daniel, Daniel gives a timeline for when this great son of man would come. And they had discerned that it was going to be sometime around the time of Jesus. And so there had been many people who had come claiming to be the Messiah before Jesus ever came onto the scene. And so when Mary heard these words, can you imagine? She must have been thinking about the prophecy of Daniel. 
thinking about what Daniel had said about this son of man coming and taking the throne of David and restoring the kingdom of God. And so she gets this great news. Now look with me in verse 36. And behold, this is still the angel speaking. He says, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing is impossible with God. So, so Elizabeth and Zechariah are relatives of Mary and Joseph. And so Mary decides that she needs to do something. She decides she's never told to do this, but she decides she's going to go and visit her relative Elizabeth. You see, that leads me to today's big idea. Our connection points others to his redemption. We were designed to connect with others. I want you to notice that one of the first things that Mary does when she receives the good news that she is going to give birth to this great, powerful son of God, Jesus, her first response is to go see someone, to go visit, to go connect. So she goes, she connects with Elizabeth. Now look with me in verse 39. So in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah and entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby in her womb, or the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So, so Elizabeth immediately, not just Elizabeth, but the unborn baby inside of her recognizes the coming of the king. And that connection point there points to redemption, doesn't it? Even before Jesus was born, a baby and his mother were proclaiming his kingship. So connection is valuable. The first action we see taken in the early developing story of Jesus is a story of connection. The first thing that happens is the connection between Mary and Elizabeth. She goes and receives the good news of her pregnancy and immediately following that, she seeks to connect with someone else, a loved one, a, a relative. She probably needed a little encouragement. Think about it for a second. She's not actually married yet. Most of you have probably heard this aspect of the Christmas story. She was betrothed to Joseph. She was engaged to Joseph, but she wasn't married to Joseph yet. And there was no telling what might happen as a result of her pre being pregnant before being married to this man. So, so she likely needed encouragement, but she probably also just wanted to rejoice with someone. This pregnancy was not something that she could go around and be excited about with everybody in her little town because she probably wasn't telling a whole lot of people because it was shameful. She wasn't married yet, but she could go to Elizabeth and she could connect with Elizabeth and rejoice. You see... In the same way in this Christmas season, connection for you and I is so important. For some of us, Christmas is a joyful, joyful time. It's a time to be thankful for the blessings we have, to rejoice in kids and grandkids and parents and grandparents. But how many of you know someone or how many of you yourselves know that this Christmas may be a difficult one for you? My grandmother passed away two weeks ago. And while I will rejoice this Christmas season, it'll be hard. 
It'll be the first Christmas without my grandma. Some of you may struggle this Christmas. And the only way to survive and thrive in redemption is to connect. Connect to your Savior. Connect to your family. You may know someone that needs to connect, but they're going to refuse to do it. You may be the connection point that they need in this season to see the redemption that we're talking about. You see, connection is so vital. That's why Jesus created the church. He didn't create the church so that there would be some powerhouse to control things. He created the church to be a a family so that we could live in our faith together, supporting and loving and caring for one another in good and bad times. That's why we have the church. I want you to look with me again at Elizabeth's response in verse 42. She says, And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken from the Lord. She lifted Mary up and she glorified the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm going to go out on a limb. The Bible does not say this, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say Mary probably needed to hear that in that moment. She probably needed that encouragement. She probably needed that connection that Elizabeth gave in that moment. So, our connection points others to his redemption. And his redemption is the point of all of this, isn't it? Christmas is a wonderful season with the the presents and the lights and the family and the food and all of it's wonderful. But it's nothing in comparison to the true reason why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Christmas because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was born so that we could be saved. So that we could, what is the word up there? Be redeemed. So that we could have redemption. Our connection points others to His redemption. Jesus came as a baby, yet the Son of God. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. The wonderful counselor, the mighty God. He came, lived a sinless life, and died on a cross so that we could be saved. I want you to, sometime this week, I want you to read the the next section of this passage. It's verses 46 through 56, Mary sings a song after hearing these words from Elizabeth. And and it's a beautiful song. She sings about how the baby in her womb will help the poor and the needy, and he will set them free. He will fight for those who cannot defend themselves. But most of all, he will save that which is lost. He will bring the life-changing hope that only he could bring. This happens because Jesus brings mercy and grace into our lives. That's what Christmas is all about. And maybe you're here and maybe, maybe you've never come to believe in Jesus. Maybe Christmas is a wonderful time for you, but you've never embraced Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Please hear me, Jesus loves you. He wouldn't have come and lived the life he lived and died on a cross for you if he didn't love you. 
His love for you is immeasurable. And he offers you eternal life if you would believe in him. And if you want to know more about that, if you want to know what eternal life looks like, there are a couple of ways you can respond today. First off, uh, we'll have one of our elders up here at the front uh, uh, as we close our service in, in worship. Uh, if you'd like to come down and talk to Alan at the end of service, uh, he would be available and would love to talk to you about what Jesus means and what following him looks like. Or you can grab a Connect card and fill it out, drop it in the offering box, go to our website. But, but if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, reach out to us. We would love to talk to you about what that looks like. But I want to close with this. What about connection and redemption is so important this Christmas season? Why would I talk about these two things for Christmas? Just as I said... Jesus created the church to be a family, to be a family that loves one another, that lifts one another up, that encourages one another, that helps one another through difficult times. And while it may be difficult for some of us to conceive, for some people in this room, Christmas is a difficult time. And if that's you, please hear me. Don't turn away the connection that church offers you. If Christmas is hard for you, this is the time when you should lean into your church family more than ever. This is the time when you should turn to your small group, your Sunday school group, the people that are sitting next to you in the pews, whoever it may be. This is the time when you can turn to those around you and through connection, not just survive this season, but see redemption in this season. And if you don't struggle with Christmas, if this is a wonderful time for you, that may be a blessing that you're being called to pass on to someone else. Maybe God has someone in your life that He's calling you to reach out to and say, I know that this may be a difficult time for you. Come with me. Let me walk with you. Come be a part of my family during this Christmas season. And through that, I challenge you, see the redemption that God may do. See the redemption that God may bring about because of the family, the connection that you have and that you extend to others during this Christmas season. So are you ready through connection to lead others to the life-changing hope of Jesus and to help others who may need a little bit of life-changing hope? Join me in prayer. 